Hoy en la taberna de rol tenemos a Nils Hinze, el diseñador en jefe de Baesen, el juego de terror misterio nórdico que nos va a estar explicando un poco la inspiración de este juego y de otros en los que ha trabajado con Free League. Juegos basados en obras de arte anteriores, juegos muy adaptables al folclore local y vamos a hablar mucho del proceso de diseño, de la inspiración y de cómo hizo este juego. Quédate ahí que la entrevista ya empieza. Hi Nils, thank you for being here. Uh, to break the ice, to start our interview, let's go back to the very beginning of your contact with role-playing games. We have seen some previous interviews you've given to, to several uh, YouTubers, media, and we understand that you got uh, into role-playing games even before you could read, which is something not many people can, can say. <laughs> Would you mind telling, telling us a little bit about how How did that happen? When did you start your first uh, games as a, as a role player? I, I had a very ambitious mother uh, <laughs> and, and a big brother, of course, who... who so, so I was playing with my mother uh, in the start. She was reading all like the rule books and, and being the game master uh, until, we, until we were older. Uh, and then I just followed along with my big brothers, friends, and played with them for, for many years before I started my own groups. So yeah, it was at the kitchen table. And, and uh, did your mother play role-playing games or was it a coincidence she found the game? No, we, we, we didn't know what it was. It was like she, she, my big brother got one, one of the first in Sweden for, for like a Christmas gift. And she was sitting with like the, the yellow marker and <laughs> trying to understand like what it was. So it was, yeah, I think it was brave of her to, to throw herself into that. And uh, what what is the role playing game scene like in in Sweden? Uh, uh, we understand that that it's really big for the size of the country. Uh, could you tell us a little bit uh, of it to understand it? How, when did it start, or how it influenced you, uh, so the, uh, people at home can understand w what's your background over there? If, if for some reason, it, it became really really big in Sweden during the 80s and 90s, and and it was not like English games or, or games from from America. It was Swedish games, and for many years, it was like at that time, it was very much like a guy phenomena. So so all guys, you know, kind of either had played it at some point or owned role playing games. So if you talk to people in in my age, in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. Everyone know what role-playing games are, and everyone has played on some occasion. Uh, but I mean, now it's much more like gender mixed uh, in Sweden at, at the moment. But, but at that time, it was just like m mostly guys, I think. Wow, that's amazing. So uh, I have a little question. When did you start writing scenarios for tabletop RPGs, following that early beginnings? <laughs> <laughs> I, I of course wrote a lot when I was just my, throughout my entire. I mean, like like all most role players do. I, I was writing campaigns and scenarios, and then a lot of very boring games. Um, <laughs> but but I I came into it uh, as a fan. Really, uh, a game was published that I really really liked. In the, yeah. It can be 2000, 2001 or something. Uh, it was called the Oktoberland. It's just, it just was generally published in Swedish. Uh, so I started writing for that um, that game. And, and that creator, he was really uh, generous. Uh, so he was really helping me. And like I got this, my text back with like a uh, hundred comments or 200 comments. And I was just, so, so he, I, I was kind of taught To, to write for role-playing games with the help of him, uh, uh, Christian Merstam, who is now writing uh, OSR games. Uh, White Hack is his most uh, famous game, I think. Wow. So he, he helped me a lot. That's amazing. So you you had support. But yeah. <laughs> the, what, um, were, were there some uh, turning point that, that you had to um, when you started like uh, putting yourself writing uh, scenarios not for yourself so for other people <laughs> in this in, was there a turning point or it was like flowing like you just uh, so one turning point was just 
thinking about the possibility of writing for role-playing games. I've never, never thought of that before. I, I, for a long time, I wanted to be like a writer, writing plays and novels and <laughs> stuff. And, and I just realized I, I'm, I, I can't really do that. Uh, <laughs> so then I started like combining my, my, my interest with my, I don't know, ambition or something. Uh, and then, of course, I was very lucky to be published by, by the Free League. My first, uh, yeah, this, actually the second version of this game that I started to write for, like 10 years later, the Free League published that game. Uh, and from that, I was I was kind of writing to, to Thomas, uh, yeah, one of the main guys of Free League, about, do you have anything else to, 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 to write, I can write for? And, uh, and we had a podcast back then, so he had listened to me and my fellow gamers, and he, he kind of knew what type of role players we were. So, so we were kind of discussing back and forth, and that that that's the reason I, I wrote uh, Tales from the Loop because yeah, they needed someone to write it, and <laughs> that kind of fitted well with my interest in, in role playing. Um, so you just mentioned for league. Um... Can you can you elaborate a little bit more about how that happened? How do you end up in, in Free League? Like, uh, just they need something to write it from the room. I think it, it <laughs> maybe there's something more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, it, it kind of started with with we kind of tossing ideas back and forth, and and at that point they were supposed to write the game, but they didn't have many ideas. They had like the idea that Tales from the Loop should be a game about kids solving mysteries. That was kind of the, the only idea that existed. And uh, and I sat a weekend with one of my friends who I play a lot with Image. He was just writing down a lot of ideas and I just sent everything to Thomas. And this is what I want to do. And he was like, okay, this is good, but you got to change this and that. And then I just started writing and, and then I wrote all yeah, the entire game during that summer. Uh, <laughs> and we, I don't think I really asked permission to write that much. I just kept <laughs> sending him texts. So so that that was some kind of lucky shot and, and, and that they actually liked what I did also. I, I, I don't think they planned that I should write such a big part of that game. So uh, le let's go to, to that game, right? Uh, you worked on Tales from the Loop. You also worked on uh, Things from the Flav. Both games are uh, based on, uh, and please uh, forgive my pronunciation, Simon Stallenhag. I don't know if I pronounced yeah, yeah. it correctly. Simon Stallenhag. Yeah. Stallenhag, yeah. all right. Uh, on his art, right? And uh, uh, this was a huge influence. And it's not something we we see frequently in TTRPGs that they are developed around the art of, of an artist, a visual artist. Uh, what was it like uh, creating an RPG uh, based uh, uh, so uh, specifically on, on artwork, right? On, on, on a visual uh, image of, of what the game tries to convey. What, what was it like? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, in, in some ways, I think it's easier uh, because you really have a kind of a foundation to build on. Uh, in, an, in, in another aspect, it's of course harder because I al also had to kind of, we were using those images. So I need to write stuff that would, <laughs> there needed to be like a police car because one of the pictures was a police car and so forth. So all the time you had to kind of write scenarios that kind of yeah, got on well with it, with the images. Uh, in, and in that case, I, I think Simon, uh, He's so good at creating like like a mood, like a uh, especially I think Tales from the Loop. It's not really a story. I mean, his later books are more like narrative, but this first one is more of a it's like a perfect image of childhood to me, uh, with some kind of nostalgic shimmer around it. So so what I did was I tried to kind of capture that mood in the game and try to imagine what would what would it be like to play in that that world? So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a long answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just sitting around with these images and just trying to kind of capture what this would be like in a, in a role playing game. So that was that was really fun and, and difficult. So a, a quick uh, follow up question: did, did you get to 
to work with uh, Simon during the development of the game or was it more like just inspiration, here are the images and work with it? No, I, ne I, I didn't meet him actually. I, I met him after both of those games were, were written. I only met him once. Uh, we had a co-interview at some party, <laughs> some RPG party actually in someone's house. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but, uh, so no, no. I, I, I have to ask another follow up question mm -hmm. then, if you didn't meet him. What did, did he tell you what he thinks about the games, or, or did you get any feedback of, of your interpretation of, of his art? Um, I think he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, this is several years ago. I don't remember. I, I, yeah, my impression is that like that, and I think that he got a he gave a lot of like feedback to the free league, and the free league were talking to me, so we were kind of having a, a discussion, but we were not actually discussion with each right. other. So there were some we have a, had a lot of kind of uh, a lot, but there were some points we were discussing back and forth about kind of is there parts of this world which is just the ma imagination of the kids. And if so, which parts? And yeah, so, so those kind of discussions were going on through mail, but for me, my part with the Free League, and they were kind of talking with him. Amazing. So, uh, changing a little bit the subject, how did you get involved with Vesem specifically? What was your role in that project? In that project, I would say that I was, um, it was more. It were, they had a clearer idea when I when I kind of entered that project, and it was kind of the same. I, I was asked to write a, a campaign module for it, so I, I traveled up to Stockholm and, and kind of sat down, and they had some like a paper back and forth uh, front with with kind of ideas and kind of this is what we want to do and stuff, and and. and then I wrote one, they asked me to write like one chapter, how to game master the game. And then I wrote another and then another and then another. And so it was kind of the same thing. Suddenly I'd written the entire game uh, and, and and I wrote the campaign at the same time. And that is still not published. So so it's kind of backwards for me. Um, but I, I didn't realize at first that uh, because that book is also based on a on a art book, um, and I didn't realize that at first. But but it's it's like a, in Sweden a really loved art book, which is which is great. I think. Um, just a, a little tangent. Uh, you said that you started working in, with this book, and suddenly after some time you did the book, the entire book. Yeah. That, that also yeah. happened with Tales from the Loop, I, I think. No? That, that was just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. is something that happens a lot <laughs> with other books that you start working <laughs> and suddenly you deliver, I don't know, 400 pages. Hey guys, edit this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think I think they liked kind of they liked uh, what I did with with building mysteries in, in Tales from the Loop and how kind of the structure of of, of kind of. The GM part of, of, of games, and that is what I'm mostly interested in. So they were like, "No, oh, perhaps you can do that for for Bats. And then when I did that, and just yeah, I just, I just kept kept writing kind of yeah. So um, what was the 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 specific responsibility for in Bison? Like they they just when when they call you, you know, like. Hey, we need you yeah. to do this before you deliver the entire game. Mm. <laughs> what was the the starting point? They wanted they wanted a, a mystery game that was going to be like not hardcore horror, but kind of like a cozy cozy horror, uh, and also I, this I like kind it. of mon yeah yeah it's it's a niche that, that, <laughs> that needs to be filled. And and they they want like the monster of the week game, which should be like. Uh, I think that they had an idea that you, you aren't supposed to, to kind of, um, I don't know how to say this in English really, but kind of promise yourself to like a two year gaming experience and read 14 books, but it should be a game where you can play two sessions and then we can play something else and you can play longer if you want. They wanted that more kind of short uh, structure. Um, I think they had, they had some ideas about the, the computer game Darkest Dungeon 
and some other more kind of darker hor- horror uh, inspiration that kind of fell away to a more kind of Sherlock Holmesy inspiration, I think. So let's talk about that, the, the inspirations. Uh, Bison is, is set in the 19th century, right? And, and it has yeah. this paranormal, these supernatural elements. It has uh, this big influence of, of folklore. Uh, how did you approach uh, 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 researching and writing these, these subjects? Because uh, I, I, I know that uh, we, we listened to some of your interviews that, that you went and, and found the different books and things. How does one uh, attack this, this kind of project, right, to, to, to uh, research these topics? At first, I had the, the original art book, you ones book, which is kind of an, I mean, it's 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 filled with information about uh, Nordic vests, and so so that's where, of course, I started. And and I think even he mentions like a, a lot of kind of uh, books w- which he had read for it. So I started reading like old books from from the early, yeah, not from the early 90s, from the early 20th centuries, and like history books and stuff. And started going on internet and checking things. So, so I just kind of trying to put some puzzle together. And that was uh, like that in the in a day by day. Like a normal research day was like this. What? So what? What? Which ones were some of your sources for for this research? Uh, uh, there were. There are some. Some like. Uh, Swedish historians and kind of folklore experts who have kind of gathered these kind of tales. So, so I, I, I kind of ventured into the deep parts of the librarians, the li- libraries, and, and kind of found old kind of books and then bought some. So I have, have kind of a shelf somewhere here with a, a lot of folklore books. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, no. And then, no. yeah, yeah, sorry. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. No, I just said. So then you ha- had to kind of because if you, if you research all of this folklore, all of the stories are kind of mixing with each other, and mm-hmm. one vast and is described in one way, and another, and, and then kind of another is described in the same way, and you, you kind of get a feeling that all of these vasans are really more kind of the same kind of uh, hours or, or themes that people had to kind of understand but they have kind of named them differently in different parts of sweden uh, but i just had to kind of ignore that and think of it as different monsters <laughs> for it to work but, but it was interesting to see that that i think most of the vassals are kind of the same creatures trying to do the same thing for the people who are inventing them well that's amazing so a, a little follow-up like was there With, what was the most rewarding part of of the research process? What, what did you discover something unexpected? Or I, I think that the most the most interesting part was like afterwards, because I, I kind of realized that this meant that I and others can can kind of go to where you live and and kind of start digging down into. Like where I grew up, there was a there was a, a mine, a coal mine. Uh, so I did a I have not pub, not published that, but I wrote a mystery about that uh, coal mine and kind of started digging in uh, old stories about where I was living, kind of mixing that with with Vasan. And, and I think that got really interesting. And uh, at times I hear people writing about where they are living, uh, if it's in Japan or Ukraine or Denmark. And kind of using their own and i think in a way it's kind of uh, i don't know how to say it but kind of discovering your past in a way and kind of mixing that into kind of a simply joyful experience of playing role-playing games but i think it adds some kind of extra touch to it as well uh, and that, that that is the most rewarding thing i think uh, so the Uh, for 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 Bison, the, the artwork was the artwork was uh, already there before you started. Um, yeah, yeah. So we know that you 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 uh, that influenced your work. Uh, but I, I have to ask: when you mention somewhat the same process we did from the loop, 
uh, you get you try to get this nostalgic dream like ambience or mood <laughs> what what did you look for in the bison artwork and and what do you get at the end of that process uh, I was kind of uh, what I was kind of pinpointing was was kind of the you say transcendence like the the the, the way that like the kind of the old society were, were going over into the, our new society. So what I wanted to kind of highlight is, is kind of the conflict between the old and the new and kind of, uh, I mean, how, how vast and are, uh, there's so much a part of the old ways of living kind of, and, and, and so, so yeah. So w one thing about the vast and role-playing game is that it takes place during like the transcendence into the industrialized age. And I wanted to be like, in the middle of, of, of going from one to the other with, with everything that's kind of associated with that, with positive and, and, and bad things, like kind of leaving the old, leaving the safe things of, of where your family has been living for, for ages. I think that was kind of like the thematical or, yeah. So uh, the, uh, that's exactly what I want to talk about right now. The the, the themes, no? like the, the thematic difference that Bison has with some other games that also deal with mystery and and monsters right you have a different approach and it's it's uh, quite quite glaring for anyone that grabs the game um, this uh, this game it's not about killing the bad monsters and and, and the gore and the violence and uh, it's uh, quite the opposite it's more it's it's morally gray uh, it's mm. uh, violence is not the only answer or, or it's not the answer period and and the the conflicts are more complex than just killing things right it it's not about killing the monster because the monster probably can come back it's, it's something more than than just a, a pile of flesh and hit points right uh, did you realize this this uh, design choice from the get-go or or was this something that was developed as you were writing the game how how did you come to develop this this difference that Bison has with other games that also deal with similar themes. I think I, I, one of the reasons that that they kind of wanted me to write for Vasen and and perhaps write for Test Loop as well is that I uh, like we had this podcast and we're playing, so they kind of knew me through that. And and I tend to not like games with, with very like black and white. I don't play. Dungeon and Dragons at all, if that is that's perhaps a harsh thing to say that you can only play. <laughs> it's okay, that's it's not okay. what I mean. Uh, but I mean, I, I want to play games that are more morally gray, which is which are about people and, and, and emotions and relationships and, and, and a little more kind of serious take on it, if, if you can say so. Uh, so if I were, were going to write a, a, a horror game, it would never have been uh, black and white, kill the dark sorcerer and the dragon thing, because I'm not interested in that. I don't want to play it and I don't want to write it. Uh, so I was, of course, trying to write things that I would be interested in myself. That's amazing. Yep. So talking about yourself, we understand you are a psychologist. Yeah, yeah. Do you think your professional background influenced this game? Um, I, I think it influenced my interest in, in role-playing games. And I think that those are kind of interconnected that I, yeah, as I just said, I'm, 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 I'm very much into relationships between player characters and non-player characters and, and kind of um, group dynamics and that kind of stuff and kind of digging into to the path of, of, of player characters and stuff. And I, I mean, you, you can't say that that isn't related to being psychologist. Of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, I think so. Yeah. yeah. When one unique aspect of Bison is that it works well for campaigns, one shot or episodic mysteries. Uh, and you, you also said that uh, this before that that wasn't something interesting in the in design process uh, was this discussed discussed the, during the design process or, or how did you come to that decision 
that that was actually not my decision uh, the kind of more episode monster of the week so that was already in place that was kind of non-discussable <laughs> so that was just this is this is going to be that kind of game so just uh, i think it worked out well I, i'm not a big fan of monster of the week games myself <laughs> though i like what happened to this but but um no, I think it worked out well, uh, but that was one of the aspects I was kind of, oh, <laughs> can I, can't I change this? But I, no, that was the frame of, of the work, kind of, yeah. So it it, it was well received. Uh, Bison uh, has won many awards. Uh, many of the products in, in the line have have won awards and, and they are highly recommended if you search social media. Uh, when people want to play games that deal with mystery, with monsters, Bison is always it's always mentioned. This is a hard question to ask someone that strikes me as as humble. But <laughs> why do you think it has been so successful? Uh, I think there are many reasons. I mean, I think it's a beautiful book. Uh, I think it's very well designed. And I think that is not a little thing. I think that's one of the things we do best in Sweden is just designing. Uh, what do you call that when you're kind of putting the words and, and Le- making the layout? I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the layout. So I think that's one part. And of course, the the, the pictures, the images. Uh, and I think it's a kind of a light game. It's easy to learn and and and, and kind of uh, take part in. Um, and I also think that 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 it, it kind of resonates with people this kind of folklore, historical aspect, uh, especially when you play kind of things that are related to your region or your country or your kind of own background. Um, and I think it also kind of places itself between kind of the. It, I mean, it's not a game; it's a game. It's not about kind of collecting. Uh, experience points killing orcs and just gaining money but it's not really a hardcore kind of uh, co-storytelling narrative really difficult game it's just like in the middle ground and, and that makes it really accessible i think to many people so i think it's a mix of, of, of many different things and i think i would also say like a side note that i think there are many different mystery games and and sometimes uh, and I think mystery games do different things. And and, and I mean, I, I would say that there are two types of mystery games. One mystery game where, is where you create a game which is actually about solving mysteries. It's about finding those pieces of puzzles and really figuring out and just sitting there and oh! And I'm not a big fan of that, which you might hear, <laughs> because I do a lot of problem solving at work. I don't need to do it at my free time. <laughs> some people love it, and there are some really great games. And this is not really that kind of mystery game. I mean, you kind of always solve the mystery in Vesson. And I think that many people who, who like mysteries are not really into it because they want to get kind of intellectually intellectually challenged. They might think they want that, but I think they want kind of the, the mood, the mystery. What is it? <gasps> and we get to find out. They don't want to kind of end up in a library. Oh, sorry, we, we missed the opportunity to find the, the piece of the puzzle. We don't know what killed the Cthulhu thing. Sorry, let's go home. Let's try another night. They don't want the real deal. They want kind of the feel of a mystery. And I, I think Vesson delivers that. I, I want to ask a follow-up question here because I'm talking to a psychologist and, and this sounds a lot like catharsis and I don't know if that's a word in English, but it's, it, it, it seems that it goes right to that Yeah, point. yeah, yeah. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> People kind of, I mean, maybe you want, you want to be challenged and you want to not know but you also want it to kind of end in some some way and you want the story to kind of finish and, and something to happen you don't want to end up with like 200 clues sitting there for three hours and just giving up and going home because you know we're solving mysteries here and <laughs> um, yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah so maybe a little related with this here in argentina bison has, uh, was really successful. In our experience with role-playing clubs, 
uh, it even filled the same niche that Call of Cthulhu once did. Yeah. So, following up on, on, on what you just said, do you think that Vicence actually shares that same space? Ooh. Uh, I, I would say, for a start, I would say Call of Cthulhu is like the perhaps the biggest game for me it's my it's, it's like the game <laughs> for me because it, it has been a part of my life ever, ever since i was small and was always like the older guys who, who were, were kind of having those games so so um and, and i think call of cthulhu can be so many things it's, it can be like all that vasan is doing but it can also be like the more uh actually puzzling problem solving mystery game um <laughs> it's a difficult question well, i don't know really uh i don't think they are so similar uh even though in the same niche um i, I think basin is more kind of light mood it kind of yeah, yeah, sorry, I can't give any better answer, but, but, but I think they're kind of similar, but no, I don't think they're just the same niche. I don't think so. Well, well at least uh, we, we talked before the interview with, with, with you guys that we we saw this this transformation from the end to go from Calf to to Bison, and they're really happy with the game. So, yeah. um, I have to ask you, with the humble thing in mind that Federico said before. <clears throat> What's your personal favorite thing about bias and, and 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 what's the thing that makes you proud of it? And maybe they are not the same. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, the, the thing I'm most proud of is, is easy and definitely when I see people writing stuff uh, for it, well, I mean, there are so many things. There are like a fan scene about Vasan, and there, are, uh, yeah, I was just a while ago reading like the Ukraine books about Ukraine myths and, and how to play Vasan there, and uh, the modern Vasan, and there are so many things that are published, and that makes me really, really happy. Uh, I, I think role playing games should be like that. You should get something that kind of helps you be creative. You shouldn't kind of buy into a series of book you need to pay for to 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 play. So that makes me really happy. But then there are many kind of technical things in in, in the kind of rules that I, uh, I I really like the this the magic system. But I don't know if anyone else <laughs> likes it, but I do <laughs> because I think it's kind of. It, it tries in a way to to be like a really storytelling thing not a kind of monster versus player character thing it's like a, a system for, for for i was just, like i'm trying I, I was trying to kind of figure out what what kind of what what's the point of magic from the creatures and what does it do in the in the stories and i was kind of thinking so how can we get to that without having to kind of point magic points and well, account magic points for, for kind of the evil sorcerer and rule dice and, and just add the kind of story elements of magic so so yeah i don't know i i, I think that yeah i think i think it's it's good <laughs> but i don't know how, how much it's used so uh, what would you say is the the most challenging part of of Rising Bison. I mean, did you ever get stuck on something or something didn't work? You really had to put the work there. What, what would you say was the, the hardest part of the design process? Uh, so many years ago now I wrote it, but um, kind of we were I, I was kind of rewriting the background part a lot and we're kind of sending texts back and forth and changing cities and how much information and and, and, and kind of how how deep should should kind of the background stories be and and how dark should they be so so that it was a lot of work if i recall rightly kind of getting that right and getting that in a way that the free league wanted it to be like uh, I think I wrote some very different stuff in the beginning and kind of had to adjust it. Right. 
Wow. So, as a designer, what's so uh, sorry? <laughs> as a designer, what's the biggest lesson uh, you've learned over the years? Um, oh, there are many. Uh, as a writer, I would say one one of my biggest lessons is to not show people what I write before I'm finished, <laughs> because I, it's so easy to think that they see what I see and they know where I'm going, but they're not. Uh, so that's something I've stopped doing. Um, yeah, but I mean, as a designer, um, playing a lot uh, games, playing a lot of role-playing games myself. Um, kind of I, I don't think I'm I don't know I, I probably steal things all the time and kind of adjust a little and I think that works for me I mean there are game designers who really create new stuff I wouldn't say that I do that I, I would say that I kind of tweak things and put them together in different but I mean there are like brilliant game designers who really do it from 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 like from nothing and just create new stuff so perhaps kind of something knowing your boundaries i don't know uh, <laughs> finding a process that's good i don't know and and continuing with the, with this what what advice will you give to some to the aspiring rpg designers especially those who don't live in the states uh publish yourself in any way you can <laughs> I would say because that it, it, something happens when when both when you are about to publish you you kind of do those extra hours of work with the text but also all the kind of response you get and just being out there seeing your your scenario on drive through rpg or wherever just publish it and stuff will happen and, and kind of discuss on on internet and <laughs> i don't know and and just get going I, uh, yeah Absolutely. and uh, is there any advice you wish you had when you first started that advice <laughs> <laughs> no, not when i was writing role-playing games but when i was starting to kind of oh, i want to be a writer long before that i wasn't publishing anything and and, and i didn't understand back then that that something happens when, when your texts start kind of crashing into others and you realize you don't know that much grammar as you thought you did and yeah stuff so yeah So, uh, what uh, what can we expect from your work in the future? Can you tell us a little bit about what, what you are working on or uh, projects you are? What you can tell us, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Electric State, another of Simon Stolenhag's uh, books, has become a role-playing game. So that is is is. I think they started to sell it now. Um, So that is my latest game I wrote, um, and Thomas Hanstam uh, wrote a lot of kind of the rule mechanics and stuff. So, so it was kind of a yeah. We were both working on, on, on it together, um, and then there is of course Walking Dead, that which I wrote yeah before a bit. Um, But the, the thing about stuff that's coming out in the future is you don't know if they're coming out. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there are always a lot of text that's just lying there, and you don't know what will happen with them. So, so I have, I have, yeah, stuff at different publishers, but I don't know what will happen with them. And then it's, yeah, it's a little dangerous mentioning anything uh, if it will never be published. <laughs> but, yeah. All right. So a uh, follow-up question on that: If you had the chance to work on any kind of project i mean a role-playing game of whatever you want what would at this moment in your life be your dream project i really want to work on this thing for example um i think i uh, one thing i always wanted to do is write for call of cthulhu uh, writing campaigns and stuff um, I think I think that would would be my answer, uh, but but I'm I'm always uh, kind of wanted to, to to answer that question myself for 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 a long time, and I, I always end up like there are so many role playing games. I don't I can't really find 
<laughs> what I should do that isn't already out there. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, right for a call of Cthulhu will be my answer. So, uh, Niels, where can people follow your updates or the updates on Bison if they want to know more about your work or follow your, your latest work? Uh, is there any anywhere they, they, they can find out this news? What, what would you suggest? Uh, I don't have anything, I think. Yeah, I had a Facebook page for a while, but I, I erased it. Um, <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to set up a new Facebook page. Uh, page in the future so so uh, yeah <laughs> i think it was it's a small decision eh? it's yeah, healthier at yeah. least yeah <laughs> yeah so so yeah there will be a nielsen so writer some kind of thing on, on facebook in the future yeah. all right so niels thank you so much for your time for sharing all of your insights your history with us uh, it was a real pleasure uh, talking to you And, and we learned a lot during this interview. I, I really learned a lot about the process behind Bison. It's a beautiful book, by the way, all yeah, of the, the yeah, products you, you have. It's, uh, and I, I think uh, it's really relatable, which is something you mentioned uh, in a lot of, of, of times during the interview. It's really easy to adapt to your country, to your story, to your themes. Yeah. I think there's something, uh, there's a little bit of the psychologist uh, they are uh, working behind subconsciously in in bison uh, so thank you so much well uh, leon i don't want i don't know if you want to say anything yes um again thank you it was this was such a treat it's really nice to have the opportunity to talk with with designers that uh do things differently i think it's the first time that we we have the opportunity to talk with someone that made a rpg game out of artwork And, and that's amazing. And I think that our point with this interview is to show the uh, inspired designers to know that you you can do it. And there are many ways to do it. So it's, it's really nice to have you as an example of that. Thank you. Yes, and uh, thank you for your time because it's really late for you now. <laughs> and, uh, and for your kind answers, like it, it was, uh, Amazing chatting with you. You, it, it was a, a, a really nice interview, and I thank you for that because every every interview is different, and, and I I I think we all enjoyed this. <laughs> this was amazing. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you, wh where are you in Argentina? Where, where are you sitting? Yeah, we are in are Buenos you? Aires. Uh, in Buenos Aires, yeah. Yeah. and uh, Puel is in a city really near to Buenos Aires, which is uh, La Plata. Yeah. 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 